welcome to Bloomberg Quint here watching the fine print. Canada, Russia, South Korea, Brazil, Argentina, France, Germany, Italy, UK and India. Tech giant Google has been battling antitrust claims across jurisdictions. Just last year, the European Commission had imposed a $2.7 billion penalty on Google for violating competition law. This week, the Competition Commission of India came to the same conclusion but put a much smaller number to Google's antitrust violations. 21 million dollars. The regulator also agreed with fewer violations on Google's part compared to what its investigation arm had concluded in 2015. So will CCI's penalty and remedies cost Google much and what precedence has the regulator set for companies in the technology market? To answer that I have with me Amitabh Kumar of JSA, Karan Chandio, Competition Practice Head at Chandiyok & Associates and Stephen Critchley, member of the antitrust team of Collier Bristow in London. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us on the fine print today. Before I come to the specifics, I'd like your quick comments on what you make of this decision of the CCI, uh, the penalty amount, the time they took for the final order, and also the approach of the regulator in a case as big as this. Stephen, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, the penalty amount, it seems to be, well, it's certainly a lot less than uh, the European Commission decision, but it's 5% of uh, Google's turnover over the three years on the relevant market, uh, which as I understand it, and my, uh, my co-panelists will correct me if I'm wrong, was, was the 5% was where they were fined at and there's a cap of 10%. So it really, it's, I think my understanding is that it's 50% of what the maximum possible fine could have been. Um, as for the scope uh, of the decision, it's, str it's striking that um, where Google was fined, uh, as you said, $2.7 billion uh, in Europe. That was just in relation to one infringement in relation to Google Shopping. Whereas I counted 11 different allegations uh, in, the, uh, in the Indian proceedings, uh, one of which was that Google had driven traffic uh, towards various of its services, Google News, Google Maps, uh, Google Flights, YouTube. Um, so really the decision uh, which was that Google in Europe had, had driven traffic to Google Shopping. That was just one microcosm of one of 11 allegations in the Indian proceedings. So the scope of it was quite surprising to a European lawyer. Sure. Mr. Kumar, what did you make of the approach of the regulator in this case? Uh, well, I mean, first thing you should notice that uh, in spite of the investigation, which has gone on from 2012 to 2018 beginning, and even if you uh, give out some time for the procedural problems that occurred and uh, you, you remember that there was a fine put on Google for sort of not cooperating with the regulator. So that was in 2014. So it's still something like uh, almost four years of investigation has gone on. You have a split verdict and that speaks volumes of for what kind of evidence is on record. So let the, the DG may have come up with 11 allegations. Uh, the four members who have gone against Google have found only two of them and the two members who have uh, dissented actually find none. So I, I think this is, uh, this is a situation where uh, it re really requires a fresh look of course, uh, the CCI doesn't have the powers to review, but I'm pretty sure this, uh, the kind of approach that has been brought out in the investigation, the inquiry, and as has been commented upon the two dissenting members, this probably is not going to go forward in the favor of the regulator. Sure. Uh, you've given me a great segue when you talked about the evidence and let's, uh, you know, hit the ground running with the first allegation against Google and that was of search bias and its universal results, which is, for instance, on news, business, etc. One boxes that are quick factual answers on time, stock codes and commercial units that are essentially sponsored ads that show up along with general search results. The CCI has noted that pre-2010, Google threw up predetermined results and didn't solve 
report results by relevance. This pre-2010 conduct CCI has found to be anti-competitive, but the conduct after 2010 CCI has disagreed with the Director General's finding that Google favors its own properties like Google Maps. Uh, Karan, did you agree with the CCI's reasoning here that there is no object objective criteria based on which Google can be directed to rank websites under the header uh, more results which comes up when we as we enter general search words well actually when when we look at the the search results and what it, what was there prior to 2010 um, they were in a fixed position so they were all grouped together and then put into a fixed position uh, and what Google claims is that they did not have the technology at that time uh, to actually go ahead and make it free floating or as the CCI would like it in, in an objective criteria where uh, it is sorted by relevance. Now it's, um, you know, the, the order does not say anything but it just simply says the fact that because there was no, um, the Google did not give any evidence as to why there was no technology. Now it sort of does beg the question that what was, you know, post-2010, which the CCI now notes that the, those now from fixed have become free-floating, as to what were the incentives to change those uh, if it wasn't for innovation or for relevance reasons. So from that perspective, when I look at it, um, it, it seems that there perhaps was a technology restriction or limitation at that time, and which has now been cured. So perhaps, you know, one has to be sensitive that, you know, this is a developing area of, of uh, you know, it's, it, innovation takes place on a daily basis in, in the tech market, and perhaps at that time, there just wasn't enough, um, you know, perhaps computing space or uh, or uh, the algorithms did not allow for uh, for relevance to take place or in, and this in the SERP page, which is the search engine results page. Okay, but I mean, CCI has not really bought this argument, right? They have said that uh, the, they have found the pre-2010 conduct to be violative of competition law. Uh, but let me come to the CCI's conclusion on commercial units. And there the regulator has found Google guilty of search bias in its commercial flight unit surface. Uh, Stephen, this is somewhat similar to the European Com uh, Commission's finding on Google Shopping, isn't it? And would you agree with the CCI's approach here? Um, well, yes and no. I think sometimes it can be forgotten that um, the intention of competition law, well certainly in Europe, um, is not the protection of competitors but it's the protection of consumers. Now consumers, uh, the competitors can sometimes obtain an incidental benefit because the regulator thinks that it's in the best interests of consumers that there are that there is competition around but sometimes the regulator can take its eye off the ball uh, and and sometimes it can start seeking to pr to protect competitors per se uh, and there were various criticisms that were made of the Google shopping decision because it was a similar thing that Google was using its search engine in order to drive traffic towards its shopping but Google was saying well listen if somebody wants to do a search for say football boots and they put that into the search engine they want the results displayed they don't want to see uh, a whole bunch of websites which are just offering services where they then have to click and go into that website and and run the search again um, and Google will say that they have uh, a more they have, they have a more powerful search engine, so they have greater reach, which means that um, the results that they return are better than the results that their competitors can return anyway. Um, so there's various arguments uh, which say that the the measures which are implemented are implemented really to the benefit of uh, of the competitors and not to the benefit of consumers. Sure. Could you also dwell a little more, Stephen, on the kind of remedy that uh, the Commission asked for from Google uh, when it uh, concluded violation of competition practices in the Google Shopping uh, product? Yeah, this is a good example, actually, of the way sometimes the Commission can end up favouring or, or prejudicing the consumer because the what was happening was when you ran prior to the decision, when you ran your search, Google would take some results from its shopping service and it would display them in boxes along the top of the, uh, the natural results. So if you did a search for football boots, for example, you get five pictures of football boots and you could click through to them on the Google Shopping. Now since the commission a decision, Google was told that it wasn't allowed to do that. So instead, it has asked its um, subscribing users to bid for advertising space. So now if you do a search for football boots, you still get pictures of football boots at the top of the screen, but those are direct adverts paid for by 
by other websites. So if you click on that box, it will take you through to that other website. But that means that now there is an additional revenue stream. Google is therefore obtaining more money, and it is costing the company more in terms of advertising to push itself up the Google ratings, which presumably is going to get passed on to the consumer in terms of higher price. So really, the remedy which was introduced in this case, you can certainly make an economic argument for saying it's going to result in higher prices to consumers. Okay, Mr. Kumar, the remedy that CCI has directed Google to implement in the commercial flight unit service, uh, is it enough to your mind that Google uh, now should put a disclaimer there saying that Search Flights Link is its own service and uh, the result is not aggregated by third parties? So I'm saying that if you look at the order, it suggests that you know when the Google flight page comes up, uh, it's, uh, it is marked as a sponsor and it comes after those. Uh, the, the ad paid or, or the paid ones. And thereafter you have the uh, typical, the, the uh, aggregators whose uh, uh, links are shown. So I think there is enough hint already given by Google that this is not something which is, uh, 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 which is, which is, which is coming out of its own, uh, own pocket and, and it has all the right to monetize, but Go, go further down and, and they, you cannot book a ticket on, on that. So what you basically see is all the flight details. Now as a consumer, I would think there is no harm in, in seeing it in a Ziphy where all, from all the other websites, the flights have been pulled out and I can see it at one space. Uh, but when I have to still do a booking, I have to still go to one of those online uh, web pages where the booking is permitted or can be done. So I both from the point of view of Google making it clear that it is a sponsored real estate on, on the page and the fact that you know no booking can be done, I don't think there is, uh, there is any reason to hold it against Google. Sorry, I just I just wanted to add to that, and, and Stephen may correct me from what from what I understand of the European order. Uh, the, the the decision is that they actually looked at data, which actually showed that there was actually traffic perhaps going from uh, to the other shopping uh, or tra drive, being driven away from the shopping aggregators. Uh, whereas in this case, when you and this comes out more so in the dissent opinion, where the dissent the two members actually say that there is actually no empirical evidence to actually support a theory uh, where traffic is actually going from from other aggregators, other online travel agents or aggregators to, uh, to Google Flights. So in that context, in fact, what they do in fact say is quite the contrary to that the others like Make My Trip, Yatra, etc. have actually done far better over these years than what, than what Google has. So without actually empirical data, to come to that conclusion may, may not actually sustain uh, going forward. Sure, and I think that goes to the point that Mr. Kumar was making earlier as to the quality of evidence that was presented to the Commission. Uh, Karan, uh, what's equally important in this order is to look at areas uh, where the regulator has found no violation. For instance, Google's AdWords program that allows advertisers to bid for trademarked words. Uh, what uh, does CCI's conclusion on this uh, would mean for trademark owners? Is the regulator telling them that they don't have a remedy under competition law? Well, that's that's in fact in fact the the decision actually says that for every anti for every intellectual property infringement or trademark infringement that the answer is not that it will lead to an antitrust violation. There are what the the commission notes is that there is enough there are policies in place that in case someone else's trademark is being used, um, then how how they can approach Google or they can approach uh, um, the, within the within the Google AdWords ecosystem. There are actually policies in place that the, the right uh, operations team has to be been asked to. to uh, to pull down the ad or so on and so forth. So with that, I think what's important, what the commission is saying is that not everything, not every contractual dispute, not every trademark dispute suddenly becomes an antitrust violation just because you perhaps are dealing with a dominant entity. What has to be seen is objectively. And I think from a, from a distinction from where we've seen the commission over the last several years to what it is, I think it's really come of age, really gone through and done a thorough exercise. It has taken six years to come here in terms of this particular investigation, but it's, it's gone and looked into minute details of how policies and practices are actually taking place and looked at an effects-based analysis. Of course, the, the, the dissent note says that you, know, you still need to go much further. But if this is where the commission is actually going, uh, and this is what we've always asked the commission, that there must be an empirical-based evidence supporting your findings, um, then, it's, then it's actually a, a great decision to look at from that perspective.
Sure, Mr. Kumar, uh, what sort of precedent does this order set for technology companies? At one point, uh, the CCI has noted in its decision that you know product design is an important and integral dimension of competition, and undue intervention in designs of search engine results page can affect legitimate produ product uh, improvements. Uh, is it uh, this pro-technology approach good for competition in the market? And especially when we are talking about dominant entities. I mean, see, the, any competition regulator has to look at the uh, commercial realities or the market realities. And today it is said it is the world of uh, the market for innovation. So uh, uh, a pro-technology approach is always going to be uh, beneficial because that is where the market is, seems to be drifting. And it's not only in, in internet, but you look at uh, tangible things and you have uh, technology embedded. So one, one has to be pro-technology. Now it is therefore very likely that uh, new technology is uh, kind of disruptive and brings to fore a particular player which is the first mover. But the, the question then is how long will that uh, dominance survive? Because there are others also lurking in, on the sidelines who are going to come up with maybe more innovative products. Uh, so, you know, instead of uh, doubting a company on the basis of uh, a superior technology, uh, as Karan put it, you know, and as the a part of the order also mentions it, any antitrust violation should be based on see, empirical data, a further uh, analysis that it actually is harming consumers and is not harming competitors. Sure. And if these two uh, benchmarks are followed, then probably uh, you know, things will, uh, be, will be better for the technology companies and the consumers at large. Sure, okay. Uh, let me come to what next as my final question. Google has to pay a 135 crore rupee penalty and carry out certain remedies, even in its negotiated search intermediation agreements. Uh, but, uh, Stephen, there are several follow-on claims or private action claims that parties make in jurisdictions like the UK uh, once they get a favorable commission uh, order. Uh, have there been so, you know any follow on claims against google uh, after you know the the european commission uh, you know came with its finding there have been. Um, there was actually one before it. I think that Foundem, uh, which is a, an internet shopping service, actually commenced its action against Google prior to the uh, the infringement decision. Since the infringement decisions come out, there's been a number of others. I believe that the Kelku.com um, uh, litigation started as a result of the infringement decision. It's always better if you get your infringement decision first because then you can bring a follow on action. It's written into legislation in the UK that the European Commission decisions are binding on the English courts, which means that you don't actually have to establish liability at all. Uh, if you sue on the back of a European Commission decision, you can leapfrog the liability phase and you just move straight to the question of how much damage you were caused by the infringement. Now, that can be quite quite difficult um, in a case uh, where you're going up against your competitors. If it was a more typical price fixing agreement, for example, where a bunch of companies had agreed to rig the price of a product, it would be quite easy to get economics evidence to say, well, it, um, if the price hadn't been rigged, uh, uh, the economic analysis can say what the price of it would have been. But here, if you're saying that Google has essentially leveraged its um, search engine in order to steal market share from its competitors. It can be very difficult to say how in the counterfactual universe what would the market shares have been. It can be quite difficult for the claimant to prove his loss because it's up to the claimant to prove how much they've lost and to make an argument for saying exactly what its market share would have been had it not been for the infringement. So that might be why we haven't seen so many follow-on damages actions as a result of the sure. uh, the competition, the um, commission decision against Google Shopping. Sure. Uh, Karen, final question to you. How easy, if at all, uh, you know, parties want to, would be these follow-on actions in India? And what do you see uh, this case uh, going to next, the NCLAT? Because I'm guessing neither of the parties here are happy with the commission's decision. 
Uh, no, absolutely. So I think from starting with the private damages, I think it will be a difficult ask for, so for some of the reasons which Stephen has already highlighted um, that will also apply equally to India. Going on the appeal, uh, I think from the perspective, you know, it's still a, it's still a fine and, uh, and still there are violations that have been found. So I'm sure Google is co contemplating and currently reviewing uh, on how when when to appeal. Uh, I'm not sure whether Bharat Matrimony or Cuts, who are the, are the, the informants, would be considering at this stage. Well, I suspect we haven't heard the last word on this as yet. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me with your thoughts on Google's antitrust violations in India. <laughs>